lot of uh, familiar names who have logged into the call. Uh, I also see a lot of new names from all around the world. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is part of an ongoing series that we call Teaching Tuesdays. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to invite in experts like Steve Dresner, who will be joining us today, to address certain topics that are both uh, interesting for entrepreneurs as well as for investors. Today we'll be talking about deal marketing on the Internet, how to use software and big data to find investors and sell your deal. Uh, as I was speaking with Steve before this uh, event, uh, I, I do think this is applicable both to uh, entrepreneurs, obviously, who are thinking about raising money, but also to investors to see how companies are raising money in this environment. It's certainly something that we see daily here on our platform, our crowd, uh, which is an equity crowdfunding platform. Uh, we have a new way for investors to raise money online, for, for entrepreneurs to raise money online. It's not the only way, and uh, Steve will address sort of some of the trends in the industry. Uh, he's going to do an excellent job of sort of drilling down and sort of best practices at this point, so hopefully uh, you'll stick with it through, through, the, uh, through the whole event. Uh, we are recording it as well. We'll send out an email probably tomorrow uh, with this recording, so in case you miss it or you want to review it, uh, you'll, have, you'll have an opportunity to do so. Uh, Steve also has just published a book, which we'll talk about at the end of the slide, so you definitely go want to check that out. Uh, he was gracious enough to, to allow our crowd sort of to provide our voice and our opinion on the, uh, on the crowdfunding and sort of deal flow uh, market at this point. Uh, I would definitely check that out. That's a new book from Wiley Press. Uh, so let's just launch into it. Um, if you have questions throughout the webinar, there is an ask a question button in your, in your webinar panel. If you submit that, Steve or I will be able to address that at the end of our, at the end of our discussion. I think I'm going to introduce, I'm going to take a couple minutes just to introduce our crowd. Steve's presentation should last about 30 minutes and that should leave about 20, 25 minutes or so for questions. So feel free to submit those to us. So just a little bit about me. I'll let Steve introduce himself. Um, I'm a partner here at OutCrowd. OutCrowd's been uh, live for a little bit over a year. Uh, we just released a press release uh, yesterday that we've, we closed a $25 million round. Uh, we basically crowdfunded that round from, from high net worth individuals, um, and we're one of the leading players in the equity crowdfunding space. That means we sort of provide an angel investing platform online. We do due diligence on deals. Uh, I run the investor community. That means I'm in, I'm my role is to help new investors get educated, get ready to get onto our platform, to make investing, investing to feel comfortable on our platform essentially. My background is in, uh, in online finance. I have a background as well in, in I work for, for a large multinational hedge fund. That was my first foray into finance. And for the past decade, I've been working with some of the top venture-backed uh, investment advisors, so the, the co-vestors, the wealth fronts, uh, the sig figs of this world. I've helped build them and build their internet uh, user acquisition strategy. I wrote a book on, on this topic in, uh, I think it's already 2009 at this point, uh, about trade streaming your way to profits, building a killer portfolio in the age of social media, about strategies that investors use, uh, using free tools online to, to make better and, and, and more knowledgeable investment decisions. Uh, that's pretty much my, my role in, about, in, in a nutshell. Steve, do you want to take a couple minutes and introduce yourself? Sure, sure. Well, uh, you know, first, uh, thanks so much for just giving me the opportunity to do a webinar uh, with you, Zach, and uh, also thanks to John and all the guys at uh, our crowd for putting uh, these programs uh, on. I think they're, they're real helpful, and today I hope to be uh, informative and offer a view of where uh, the world of online deal uh, marketing is today and uh, more importantly where I think it's all headed. So just uh, by way of a quick background, um, I've been a startup guy basically my, my whole life. Um, I started my first company back in the 90s when young guys like myself in our 20s were chasing internet riches. That was a software company called uh, VCOM, which was actually kind of a project that started uh, originally with an Israeli-based company by the name of Vocaltech that was first to do voice over IP, and it was systems integration. It was software all related to telecom. I sold that in, uh, in uh, the summer of 2000, right as the bubble was bursting, and uh, had a brief, very brief stint as an investment banker where I became something of an expert in pipe transactions and other types of private placements. And, um, and then from that experience, I put together my first book called Pipe. 
tapes which became very popular. Then I put together another book with a friend of mine on reverse mergers. I started publishing newsletters, hosting events, uh, publishing data and database services, and that whole endeavor became my last company, DealFlow Media, which I was fortunate enough to sell uh, just about a year ago in 2013. Uh, and uh, along the way, I've been involved in all types of different fundraising projects, from fundraising on my own behalf to helping hedge funds uh, raise money, helping some small companies raise money, helping some companies go public here in the U.S. So you know, I think I bring a good perspective to this whole uh, area of raising capital, both as someone who's been doing it for myself and helping others do it. So I guess that's, uh, that, 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 that's a brief background. Like uh, Zach just mentioned, I also just published a book uh, with Wiley, which Zach and uh, John Medved over at our crowd uh, participated in. It's a collaborative book called Crowdfunding. Uh, I guess I'll preface with uh, uh, the presentation today is not so much about crowdfunding as it is about general trends of marketing deals online. I think crowdfunding sort of epitomizes what we're talking about. But the topic today is going to be a little bit uh, broader than just, uh, just crowdfunding. Great. So with that, I just want to take uh, two minutes before, uh, before Steve launches into the, uh, the meat of, uh, of, his, of his presentation. Um, we are now the global leader in equity crowdfunding, and by that I mean uh, we've, done, we've invested the most uh, money into uh, portfolio companies. We launched in 2012. As I said before, we have a community of about 4,000 accredited investors from over 50 countries around the world. Uh, our model is a little bit different than the, uh, the angel list of this world. It's not really just a, a marketing platform. Uh, it is a curated platform, which means all the companies that appear on our website uh, we invest in. Um, we actually run a full due diligence process as a regular venture capitalist would. Uh, we end up investing in the company before we open it up uh, to the crowd. So it's, uh, it's a different model than some of the larger uh, network models, um, but still it seems to be working well. We have, we've invested alongside other VCs like Excel Partners, uh, Kosla, Kanan, Microsoft, Horizons, which is uh, Li Keqing's uh, uh, vehicle, and, and others as well. So um, check it out if you're interested in learning more. Uh, this speaks to sort of just the model that, uh, that we've, we think works well for us. Again, as, as Steve will address uh, in his presentation, there are other models. Um, basically, we, we founded a team with some of the people here in Israel who have a lot of on-the-ground investment experience. Uh, we believe that's what it takes to, uh, to make uh, a successful, from the investor side, a successful endeavor. Uh, John Medved, who Steve mentioned, is, is our founder, who is one of Israel's top leading venture capitalists. Um, he's had 12 exits over $100 million. Our crowd was his brainchild. Um, Elon Zivotofsky is an old friend, joined originally. Uh, he ran Goldman Sachs equity arm here in, uh, in Israel, uh, very familiar with the local Israel team. We built uh, what we believe to be you know, an A-class uh, diligence team. That means so, so we see upwards of 120, 150 deals a month at this point, so the volume is huge. Uh, we run our filters, we meet with companies, we end up investing, so we give access to some of the best opportunities. And it gives individual investors sitting around the world, you know, whether you have access to this, this type of deal flow or not, uh, the ability to invest frequently alongside some of the top venture capitalists who are investing alongside us at the same terms that these venture capitalists are. So we, we think it's really a novel model. Uh, it seems to be, uh, obviously the demand is there for, on the investor side. Uh, one of the things that we find very interesting as well is that the, the comp we're beginning to win deals away from larger venture capitalists, not because we can move faster, which we can, um, but what, what's really happening is that companies themselves see the ability of crowdfunding at least um, to not only bring in new capital and new sources of capital to their companies, um, but to help their companies in ways that VCs don't necessarily or can't necessarily do. Uh, we call it crowd building here at our crowd. So you know, we, we invest in a company called uh, the Hicon, uh, which which is a large industrial digital printer like in the creasing industry. Um, not a real sexy deal, but we, we invest along some of the, the top venture capitalists here in Israel. Uh, what happens then is, that, is our army of investors, so we, we put together an angel team of you know, 50, 60 uh, top you know, high net worth individuals around the world. Those, those, those people now have skin in the game, and they're, 
we now have an army of biz dev guys who are going out and helping those companies grow. So um, it's not just the source of capital that we're talking about, but it's also what happens afterwards, helping mature and exit these companies that I think we can provide a lot of value with. That's our crowd in a nutshell. I don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Uh, I, before Steve starts, I do want to – there was a, someone did mention they had trouble hearing Steve uh, through the webinar panel. If, if you can, Steve, uh, can you just say a couple words? I want to make sure that everybody can hear you. Sure, sure. Am I uh, am I coming through at this point? P please let us know in the uh, in the audio options if you can hear Steve. Yeah, if there's any uh, problems, you'll just let me know, uh, Zach. Um, so, okay, why don't I get started here? Uh, you know, a lot of uh, the discussion is going to be very forward thinking. So, if if someone's got a question, you know, I know Zach, you like to do uh, the questions at the end of the program. If something pops up that you think is important, in other words, requires some clarification, feel free to stop me, and you know, we could address uh, on the fly. Um, For sure. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm also going to uh, just point out that I'm going to be talking a lot about both how companies can target investors and also how investors can target companies. I mean, this is really a two-way uh, discussion here, uh, and I'm also going to try to be relatively uh, relatively quick because I know we don't have a ton of time. Um, uh, so what is the future of deal marketing? I posed this question at the onset here. Uh, and if you move to the next slide, you see the answer I believe is software. I should say at least in part software. The problem as I see it, as we see it at dealflow.com, having been working on the field of collecting actively marketed deal data for about two years, the problem in a single word is distribution. If you're an agent, a bank, or a broker, and really an agent in any business, you've got the same problem, which is you've got a product, you've got a, ser a service you're trying to sell. How do you find people interested in that product or service? It's got to be targeted. And I'm sure a lot of people on the call are signed up to an angel list or deal portals, and you know every Sunday night you get your email with like the six latest opportunities. And the problem as I see it, going back to this notion of distribution as a core issue, is that those opportunities are generally not very well targeted. So where I think deal marketing is, is, is heading is, 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 is largely to use data, use more information to fine-tune investors' preferences who's looking at specific companies, and if, like I said before, to do the reverse. If you're a company, to be able to use data and information to fine-tune your approach to specific investors. So a few things just to keep in mind before we get started started, this notion of what I'll call efficient markets. It helps if you take a big step back and, you could, and we can get some, some uh, I'll call it agreement, that deals are increasingly looking more like product. I mean, up until we had these changes here in the U.S. on general solicitation, you couldn't market private placements outside of your own established relationship network. Now you can. Uh, a few years ago, we saw FINRA uh, uh, put out new rules on how you could use social media to talk about stocks and deals. So the world has been changing rapidly, and now you have an environment uh, where deals are all over the place. I mean, we pick up actively marketed uh, 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 transaction data from advertisements, emails, of course, word of mouth, deal portals, social networks. So there's a huge flow of, of, of information on deals. And if you, if you look at it, deals they're just product. They're complicated product. And a firm like our crowd in structuring the investments, you know, you need human beings, you need bankers, you need people to explain, to do due diligence, to dig in. But the idea of deals as product, I think, has a lot of uh, efficacy. Uh, and much like uh, other product before, um, uh, it will move on to the Internet, deals that is, will move on to the Internet, and, and a lot of information will, will be built up around those deals, and I think some of the greatest markets, efficient markets, will be formed uh, because of it. Uh, uh, another thing to point out, just, you know, and, I, and I'm going to get into a little bit more detail as we move through the, uh, the presentation, but just to cover it briefly, this growth in online deal marketing. I mean, the, the data uh, uh, points to the, uh, the trends here, and the fact that you know, an OR crowd is raising 
raising uh, $25 million for a relatively uh, nascent uh, area. Uh, Lots of interest in, in, in this stuff. And uh, there have been some statistics put out there by Intralinks. There are statistics put out by a number of the crowdfunding portals, uh, and even some of the traditional uh, crowdfunding or product-based portals like Kickstarter. You could just see that there's so much momentum behind this movement toward deals and deal-making uh, online. So I think we're all in the right, uh, the right area discussing the right uh, topics insofar as in investment trends. Uh, and then the third point, uh, which I mentioned uh, uh, before, is that this is bigger than crowdfunding. Uh, as a personal interest, and in terms of our business at DealFlow.com, we're not only interested in startup deals or venture deals. What we think is happening is going to be a full-on migration of all types of deal marketing onto the Internet, including deals in all sectors, all different types of strategies, to the point where eventually a Morgan Stanley, your bulge bracket investment banks, and some of them already have this, but if not, they will have portals connected to their websites where if you're an accredited investor or you're an institutional client, you could log in and see the inventory of, uh, 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 of their deals. And I'm, I'm fairly sure of this because the important thing to keep in mind, I mean, Zach and I, I think, are roughly in the same age bracket in our mid-40s. Um, uh, and, and, and but but the world you know of of research of uh, finding information has changed. So guys like like me and Zach, you know, we might not move right to the internet to do deal research to network with people who could show us deals. But the younger generation, the guys coming up in the business on Wall Street, working at Morgan Stanley, whether they're bankers or they're analysts or they're traders, investors, I can guarantee they default today to the Internet to find and discuss opportunities, which is why all this regulatory change in the U.S. has been so exciting and, and, and so important. So, so all right, let's, let's keep it moving because I could just talk forever. So anyway, again, w what we're going to talk about is bigger than crowdfunding. It relates to all deal marketing. Um, maybe next slide, Zach. I've already moved it. It should, it should drop any second. Okay. Okay, so, and I'll, I'll blast through some of this because I already touched yeah, on keep it. Going. So this idea, yeah, that, that, that we've got you know, efficient markets relying on information. Um, if you look back in like the 90s, some of the killer apps on the Internet were all stock a lot of them were stock-based companies. Your 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 E Trades, your Scott Trades, even Charles Schwab. You know, you 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 had historically had a lot of retail brokerages, a lot of smiling and dialing, phone-based selling, and then once these uh, these firms started to put research online for their clients, they were able to help themselves to the information, to 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 find stocks, bonds that they would have interest in, and to buy them themselves. It made the markets more efficient. It made uh, transaction costs mu much lower. It was really a win-win for for it for everyone. Uh, and, and the same thing is happening now in in the primary market. So you know, with stock trading, those are secondary transactions where an investor is interested in buying some stock. He puts up money. It doesn't go to the benefit of an issuer or a company raising that money. It goes to another investor who was holding that security. So now we're seeing the same type of thing happen with capital raising, where if you're an interested investor that wants wants to follow deals, and you know that uh, John and Zach are doing a lot of due diligence on the companies coming through their platform. Maybe they've got a particular focus on Israeli companies, so you know the hundred deals that they're seeing uh, every day or every week, a good majority of them are based in that region. Therefore, they're seeing the best deal flow. You, know, you could tap into that just like you would have tapping into uh, one of these online stock trading networks in the 90s and benefit from that deal flow, and ultimately the investment that you make, unlike buying in a secondary market like the stock market, would go directly for the benefit of the company. It could be a structured transaction. You could wind up getting price efficiencies and all that. So it's happening uh, uh, in the deal world, and I believe that the most efficient markets are going to be heavily using information and data tagging and, uh, and some, some new software analytics technologies. Okay, next slide please, Zach. Uh, 
sort of uh, continuing with the thoughts on efficient markets. Uh, uh, you've, you've seen in, in new Internet businesses like Pandora, like what uh, Netflix does, like what Amazon is doing with their retail engine, a use of, uh, of uh, uh, information to, uh, to figure out what kinds of preferences their customers have. And uh, the same will be happening with deal marketing, figuring out on the investor side what types of uh, products, services, geographical uh, regions a company is doing business in that might match up with your own interests. And conversely, the same would hold true if you're a uh, uh, CEO at a company raising money, how to find investors who based on information would have interest in what you're doing. So again, this idea that efficient markets are developing around a, lo a lot of information in all other areas, and it's important to look at deals in the same context, which is it's just product. It's unique product that requires the assistance of people to close lots of deals, but the idea of figuring out how to find and research the deals, target companies and investors in deals, it's all happening and it's all based on this idea of a massive amount of information moving on the Internet. Okay, next slide please, Zach. Uh, we talked a little bit about this. You know, the number of deal portals is growing. Uh, I think there's uh, at the bottom of this slide, you've got at this point it's well over a thousand uh, companies that are doing some form of crowdfunding. It could be product-based, debt-based, equity-based, uh, and that's a worldwide figure that I think the guys at crowdsourcing.org put out. Um, but 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 lots of growth here. Uh, and my personal prediction is that there'll also be a lot of fallout, and in a couple of years you'll see consolidation consolidation largely around uh, portals that are either focusing on just product-based crowdfunding or debt-based, you know, strategy-specific, or perhaps region-specific, where, you know, there'll be portals that specialize in, uh, uh, in, in restaurants or portals that specialize in making investments in the Northeast U.S. Uh, so lots of growth, but I think eventually we're going to see some consolidation as well. Okay, next slide, Zach. Boy, this business is growing so much we don't want to leave the slide. Okay, so uh, this is something <laughs> – I'm sorry, I stepped on you, I think, Zach. No, no worries. I had to advance the slide. There's about a 10-second lag, so um, – Okay, just so you know. cool. Okay. Um, I like to, you know, in DealFlow's own biz dev efforts when I'm talking to investors and prospective investors, I always like to point to real, you know, authoritative statistics, data, and information. And when I talk about the growth in this whole area of deal marketing, and even if we just look specifically first at what's happening to private placements, which is really how all these venture deals are being done, you could see right in the SEC's own proposals in their final releases, what they think is going to happen to this business, the estimates that they have. They always have to do this cost-benefit analysis. So there's always a big discussion in their documentation about what they predict will happen to deal marketing. And even in, 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 the, in the release that they first put out in, uh, I think it was July. I know I say here it's, it's August. But, but in any case, in the summer of 2012, what was so interesting was that within that first release on the changes to Reg D and the use of general solicitation. Uh, they talk about the types of services that will be developed because of the repeal of the ban on general solicitation. Services just like we're working on at DealFlow, which are going to allow people to use a massive amount of information to better target deal opportunities that would be of interest to them and for companies to target uh, investors that might be of interest to those companies. Okay, next slide. If you want to just continue, I mean, the slide's advanced. Just talk to the slide here. Okay. It'll pop up in a okay. second. Okay. Very cool. You know what? I actually have a hard copy, so why don't I just do that? That's a good idea. Um, uh, a quick overview of the marketplace. Uh, 
there, 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 you know, it's hard to get get a good handle on the number of investors who are looking at deals online. I mean, you hear statistics. The U.S. Census Bureau, I think, in 2012 put out statistics that said there was something like 8 or 9 million uh, U.S. accredited households. Uh, I think a lot of people are accredited by definition, but that doesn't mean they're actively investing in deals. So as I look at sort of the total market that, that one can grab as a deal portal, I, I don't think it's 8 million. I think it's a much smaller segment of that, maybe a couple hundred thousand in the U.S. On top of that, of course, you've got a lot of institutional investors. In my view, you know, much like I was saying before with your, you know, your 20-something, 30-something at Morgan Stanley, the same is, is happening at venture firms uh, uh, now, at least here in the U.S. You walk into any one of these offices, and the fact is the phone rings less. People are not dealing like, you know, like guy, like a guy as old as I am in my mid 40s, deal which is phone based events in person. You know, there's text chat, there's instant messaging, there's email. You know, and there's deal portals. So you know, it's a big marketplace. There's a lot of individuals who I think are going to tune into this idea that you know now they can have access to all types of opportunities that previously they didn't have access to. Not just startups. Again, I go out of my way to say this isn't just about startups. All deals will. Move in this direction. If you're a distressed debt or a venture debt buyer, eventually there will be markets formed around those uh, those strategies or sectors. So this is, you know, uh, deal agnostic strategy and structure and sector agnostic uh, stuff right here. Um, moving forward. Um, there are a handful of companies out there looking to solve what I, I call it, pro, you know, problem solving in the data analytics space. Crunchbase, uh, people know about. Uh, it, it's crowdsourced. Uh, it's it, it's fairly incomplete, but it's very widely used by uh, by other data providers and even by investors. Companies like Mattermark uh, that are focused on detailed, uh, I'll call it triggering uh, information on startups. It's subscription based uh, you, you sign up you could you know track uh, changes to the number of Twitter followers a company has or its rankings in Alexa on the web to see if they're getting significant uh, increases in web traffic just this morning I was reading about a company uh, uh, newly I think out of Harvard called spot rocket that sounds like they're doing something uh, uh, very similar where they're trying to use data uh, to to determine success of startups. I mean, uh, I'm a little skeptical about some of this stuff uh, because I think that, you know, just because guys graduated from an Ivy League school or because a company is getting a lot of traffic on Twitter and Facebook, I don't necessarily know if there's going to be any positive correlation uh, between those stats and what makes a successful company. But anyway, guys like Spot Rocket and Mattermark are trying it. Dashboard is very similar. Uh, uh, the guy running Dashboard, which I think they're also calling Indicate.io, uh, was, was previously a partner at 500 Startups. They're tracking a lot of data also in the world of startups, uh, uh, networking applications using that data. And I think importantly, they're also getting into the investment business. I heard that they're raising some money so that they could use their own software to find investments. And I really think that's very interesting because having been a guy who's run media properties and subscription databases, I think the world is less interested in paying for information. Even if you have good information, it's still hard to convince someone to pay for it. And in uh, Paul Singh's case, uh, who's the guy running Dashboard, I think the conclusion that he's come to is that if what he's built really works, why sell it to people? Why not just use use it for his own, uh, uh, own principal investing. So I think that's an interesting trend uh, to watch. Uh, this company Traxon, uh, same thing, another startup database. Relationship science I'm very interested in. Uh, these are the XCAP IQ guys. It's sort of a LinkedIn on steroids, uh, problem solving in the area of figuring out you know, how to find particular investors and doing deep, uh, deep dives on data to, to, to target investors, to target 
target investments, and of course uh, what we're doing at DealFlow, which you know I'll cover uh, uh, cover uh, in a little uh, in a little more detail uh, in a few slides. But 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 interestingly enough, this morning there was an announcement of, of, of a company. I think they're a startup portal. Um, Seed Change is the name of the company that was offering uh, custom uh, uh, tailored advice based on your preferences. And again, that's where I think this is all going. And I will talk about it when we get into deal flow. Uh, this idea that you could set your own triggers, you're interested in certain types of companies, in certain areas, certain strategies, with certain management criteria. So, um, so I, I think what they're talking about, although I don't know if they're a registered entity and how they're making suggestions, because that also starts to get into some gray area on whether a firm is providing investment advice and do they need to be FINRA registered. But the concept of what it sounded like what they were doing I thought was very interesting. Uh, next slide. Uh, firms receiving investment in this area. Uh, Zach here broke down this one slide into several slides. I mean, you could just see how much capital is going into this area and a lot of smart money. Uh, or Crowd, it sounds like they tapped into their own accredited network to do their deal. I'm sure there would be plenty of venture firms that would line up uh, to get into that deal uh, just to get access to what they're already seeing in terms of deal flow. Uh, if you look through the investors in these deals, there's just a ton of smart money and a lot of repeat venture investors who clearly believe in this this global space that's not just crowdfunding, but, but deal marketing and deal advertising and even deal and data analytics. So tons of, uh, tons of exciting uh, news there uh, on the funding front. Um, uh, moving forward, uh, how, and this is really getting into the heart of it, uh, how you should view the future of deals and specifically data related to deals. In our world, there are two primary inputs in the world of deal tracking. There are deals, which are really companies running deals, and there are investors in those deals. So you've got two basic parts of the equation. There are also what I like to call the three I's that are involved in the deal business. Issuers, which is the company that's issuing securities to raise money on their own behalf. Investors uh, and intermediaries. Uh, and those three sort of entities comprise the bulk of the channel for deal making and the bulk of the interest in deal data on the Internet. Then in our world we break data down into sort of two broad groups what we call hard data and soft data. Hard data would be sourced information like you would see on a crunch base. A company closes its deal, there's a press release, you could pull the, the basic deal terms out of it, the amount out of it, the closing date, the investors, basic stuff, all sourced to some release or some regulatory filing. Uh, and then there's soft data, which in our world is, is contextual in nature, which means you know, a company may say, hey, you know, we're a, a healthcare company. They check a box on a Form D with the SEC saying they're healthcare and furthermore they're biotech. But if you go to their website, what you could see is they do something very specific within healthcare and biotech. They have a certain type of cardiac medical device. So adding that information that an issuer doesn't volunteer to you I think is very important important to build the data sets that can ultimately be used to properly target investors for deals. Um, and the idea here is that, you know, I wrote this at the bottom of the slide we're looking at, if you give investors access to really deep data, then you could get a better understanding of what their true preferences are. It's not any different than Netflix or Pandora except it's going to be a lot more, uh, a, a lot more detail, and therefore a lot more accurate. So, uh, look at it like this: a guy like Zach or like me, we've got very comprehensive LinkedIn profiles. We've got corporate bios out there on web pages. You could read blogs that we've written. You can find out articles about us. You can learn, you know, my my my, my personal interests that I'm a, a, a private pilot that I like to, you know, go hiking. All of that data, which is out there in public is collectible, which means you could 
compile it to build a true uh, uh, index of preferences on someone like myself or like Zach, to know that we're not just broadly interested in making investments in healthcare, but we're interested in investments in cardiac medical devices. So if you could you know, get your head around this idea that deals are product and they're moving onto the Internet, you could get access to this product, and that a lot of the people operating in this market, whether they're institutional investors or there are credit investors who is a project manager at IBM that information is increasingly becoming available. My view on it is that in building profiles and building data sets, if you use it the way you tell people you would use it, that is not to sell them credit cards and, 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 and other services, but if you use it to help make matches or to help fine-tune preferences for purposes of targeting, that it's, that it, that it's okay that it's acceptable. And of course, you know, the companies that are getting into this area I think should use all the appropriate legal disclaimer ultimately because what we and others are doing is so new, we'll have to see uh, what the market uh, uh, responds to, what, what, how, what they think about the ability to, uh, to do very uh, granular targeting for deals and investments uh, uh, based on uh, all this uh, data. So okay, uh, Zach's already on the next slide. The way we're solving problems. So, I mentioned at the very onset of the call this idea of distribution. That to me is everything. As I sit in my office and I think about how to make stuff for people, there's only one thing that I'm really concerned with, and that is distribution. Unlike an angelist who does a great job and is the market leader, no doubt, on their Sunday night email when they send out six deal opportunities, I look at that and really, you know, nine times out of ten, I say I'm not interested in any of these deals. And they should know that because you know, there's information about me out on the internet, plus there's information that I've given them about me. I've told them I'm interested in newsletter companies, I'm an ex-media guy, I like financial databases. So why they're sending me a business uh, idea of a guy who's got shipping containers over in China makes no sense in my world. Better to send somebody an email that has something very specific tailored to their true preferences. And, and, and also when you think about this, you know, everybody's flooded with email. The big risk that you run when you're a deal portal is list fatigue. If you mail those six deals every Sunday to the same guy, and six Sundays in a row, none of those deals are interesting, eventually that guy's not opening the email anymore. So if, if everybody you know, can get on board with this idea deals are moving on to the internet, a lot of the marketing will take place via internet type distribution like email, I think the key is going to be using the data to make sure that someone who's notified that there's a deal that they'll be interested in, that there, there actually would be interest there. How we're solving it is, is through the use of recommendation engines. We've spent two years building these massive data sets focused on those two primary inputs, investors in deals and companies raising uh, money for deals. If you tag and index all this contextual data associated with both those inputs, you could be, begin then to make algorithms and use all types of software to weight the relevance, the timing, all, all of this stuff could be uh, mathematically organized to figure out how to create matches you know, just like a Pandora, just like a Netflix, an Amazon, or a Match.com. But as I said before, after having been working on this for two years, what's truly interesting thing about this whole area is that there turns out to be a lot more information than you would get in a Pandora. I mean, I use Pandora and I use Netflix, and occasionally my kid even uh, uses my Netflix. So Netflix sees that I'm watching SpongeBob, and I don't have interest. Well, sometimes I have interest in SpongeBob, uh, uh, but 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 you know I have very uh, uh, certain um, you know uh, creative interests, television, movie watching, whatever, and and that's not. You know that's not something that uh, that Netflix could figure out uh, 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 without my interaction with their their product. In the world of investing, because there's so much data that's now available, you can figure that out. We call it solving the cold start problem, which is even before I launch our product, which hasn't gone online yet, I'll know enough about someone that I can really figure out what they should be interested in. So if we take their interest 
lists that I've collected and indexed, and we pair it with their interaction of a database so that every time they go and they use the software to look at deals that are being marketed, and they stop their mouse on a deal, they forward it to a friend, they track it. I've got a series of pluses and minuses, you know, positives and negatives that allow me to score their interest in that deal so that we develop the personalized statistical model specific to each active investor and every single deal that sits in the database. So we could make recommendations even if they don't specifically ask to track that deal. If we could determine that they spend more time looking at cardiac med devices than they do at shipping containers over in China, and if we've collected a lot of index data and maybe we could figure out that a guy graduated from the same university as the CEO of a company that's marketing a med device uh, uh, where they might have some common friends, then that would be you know, a very high probability score that the company should talk to that investor. So again, all based on this massive amount of, of collectible and organizable, if that's a word, uh, data. Um, uh, moving forward here. Um, uh, well, I guess we're sort of getting to the end of the presentation because I, I didn't want to make it too long. Uh, but everyone should sort of get the idea. Again, it's not only about crowdfunding. I think crowdfunding epitomizes this notion of deal marketing on the Internet. Um, uh, I think that the, the one, you know, Zach and the guys at OrCrowd talk about crowdfunding as a very broad, um, uh, a broad movement, uh, which right now really encompasses a lot of what I like to call accredited crowdfunding, where you have to meet the criteria in order to invest and to get behind uh, uh, the, the registration wall and see detailed financial information about a company raising money. It remains to be seen what we have here with the SEC and the rules and you know, will, uh, will, will mainstream uh, uh, crowdfunding be viable? Will companies do it uh, uh, in, a, in, you know, in a large scale kind of a way? I think so, but it's still very early. However, However, all of the indications insofar as the trend of deals being marketed online, the ability to use all this information and data, it's happening regardless of the crowdfunding movement. And eventually, my view for sure that crowdfunding will be worked out so that unaccredited investors will be able to participate in all types of investments, startups, operating companies, public companies. That's the way it's going. And anybody with any insight into the SEC, we're very fortunate. We have an ex-SEC board member on our company who is uh, 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 very active in drafting Reg D. Uh, and you, 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 you can get a sense that, that they're thinking about this, that they know this will happen. So I think you know, we'll see an initial uh, release of the crowdfunding rules. There will be some you know, kinks to work out, but they will be worked out. And eventually, uh, uh, crowdfunding uh, uh, will develop, I guess, into what a lot of people uh, would consider an asset class. Uh, we'll see how long that takes. Uh, last slide here, although I say you know, it's not all about crowdfunding, I can't help but at least pitch the book that, we've, that we just put out on crowdfunding. Uh, Zach and John participated in it. We've got about 10 other uh, 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 folks who wrote chapters. Uh, it's a technical read. Um, it, it covers you know, everything about how to use crowdfunding to market a deal, to finding deal portals that fit your needs, uh, global rules and regulations. You know, it's really a completely unbiased book. I myself have a very even view on crowdfunding, uh, and I think uh, uh, you'll, you, you'd pick up on that uh, in terms of how I did the, uh, the edit on the book. So I guess that's it, Zach. If we've got some questions, you know, happy to uh, address them. Great, Stephen. I'm sort of sad to hear you stop presenting. I, I Literally, I could sit and listen to you uh, present all day. I think uh, you know your stuff, and, it, and it's just such a compelling uh, discussion given your, your expertise and your experience in the market. Uh, we do have a handful of questions uh, that have come through. Uh, if you do have a question for Steve or for me, please uh, feel free to submit that via the Ask a Question button on your meeting burner panel. Um, so. So the first question came through, uh, and I guess, it, I guess your slide about um, some of the new markets, we, we made the comparison um, sort of V1, which was like the E-Trades and Schwab's, uh, to the second generation of markets. Do you see, uh, you and you basically mentioned Prosper, do you, do you sort of see like the whole deal marketing thing creating entirely new investable assets like, like the peer-to-peer -peer loan? 
Is that, is that oh. trend going to continue, I guess, is the question. Oh, oh, for sure, for sure. I mean, there are funds. You know, I mean, uh, largely as a company, DealFlow.com and our predecessor company, DealFlow Media, which we spun out of when we sold the other assets, we've been focused on institutional products, not, you know, uh, individual products or accredited individual products, and with the prospers and what's happening to peer-to-peer -to -peer lending, I mean, there's, there are there are there are dedicated strategy funds being set up to invest in that stuff. So that has a huge amount of momentum, huge. So definitely, the, that becomes a very unique asset class with uh, unique return uh, uh, characteristics and all that for sure, hundred percent. So there, there's sort of, I guess, you could call the follow-on uh, question to, to, to that. Um, so given the fact that it's, it's getting easier to market uh, deals online and, and tools like DealFlow.com will make it easier to target your, your sort of investor group, what, what, can you talk about what you think the sort of supply-demand dynamics are going to look like sort of the future? Um, if, it is, you know, if there are more deals, is there more money flowing in? Uh, Valuation is going to go up or down? How do you see that sort of playing out? Well, I mean, the way we view it is all this adds to transparency and more efficient markets, like the comparison on the slide we're talking about to E-Trade and Ameritrade and the guys that moved on uh, line with stock brokerages in the 90s. You know, the, 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 when I talk about distribution and using data, I mean, 90% of the work that a banker does is just sales. There is a utility for bankers in structuring and, 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 and negotiating and selling and all that, but really what they do is they have a Rolodex. What, what we contemplate is a, is, a, is a world that's not far off. It's basically now where a company raising money doesn't need a broker, and in the venture space where the optics of using a broker are quite poor, they could access their own Rolodex through all this available data. So, uh, you know, how I see the supply demand side working is fees for a lot of brokers will go down. Brokers will, uh, will start to use services like ours that are uh, leveraging uh, accessible data and information on, on, on potential uh, investors. And I think the home market will start to take on more of uh, you know, one of the uh, uh, companies in here that I didn't talk about, Expedia, will take on more of a data aggregation kind of a feel where you know, way, way back you call a travel agent or you call an airline or a hotel, but nobody does that anymore. You go right to a website where a lot of this information is aggregated, where you've got a marketplace you can click through and you could buy, and deals will look a lot like that. I mean, there will be aggregators and it will create much more efficiency and there will be you know, probably a lot more uh, supply and demand with on the supply side of deals, a lot of deals shaking out much sooner that just are never going to get funded. So I, I just predict you know, a way more efficient market, lower fees, and you know, when we were running a, a data service called Private Raise in the pipe space, bankers used to come up to me and say that I ruined the pipes business. And what they meant was that because I made all this data on fees and structure available to companies, we destroyed their, their, their business models because they couldn't charge 10% in cash commission plus 10 cent in a warrant because now companies could log into private raise and see that comparable companies were only paying 8% or 6%. And, and what happened in that area, like in a lot of areas of financial data, is as the data becomes more accessible, the fees come down, which is better for issuers, and the syndicates increase, which is happening with equity crowdfunding, where you know, in the pipe world, you started to see like a, a, a transaction where one banker controlled the deal and got paid 10 and 10, and then over time, you had like three or four bankers in the deal, and the companies were giving a little bit to everybody so that they were getting attention, weren't affecting anyone, there was a little more research coverage, and the syndicates of investors also broadening. So, you know, when we look at the market online, we're, we're taking a cue from the same stuff that happened in other areas. None of this is completely novel and crazy stuff. We look to financial data, we look to uh, travel data aggregation, we look to retail moving online, radio, television, it's all there. And now it's just new because of SEC rules and companies like you know, yours at our crowd that were able to tap into all the data. So it's, it's going to create more efficient markets. 
Great answer. Uh, there's a couple more questions. I have one. Um, you talk about tools like, like dealflow.com getting better at identifying prospective uh, investors, whether that's scraping their LinkedIn, making sense of their LinkedIn profiles. Um, one of the things we're seeing at our crowd is that there's an entirely new investor class of people who wouldn't necessarily describe themselves as angel investors. Uh, they're not really in the business of investing in private companies, but some of the crowdfunding platforms are attracting those people, and, and they're becoming you know, sort of new, new, new investors in this type of asset class. Um, are there tools to sort of, can you imagine a day where there's predictive tools where you can sort of say this guy is primed you know, to eventually be an investor given X, Y, and Z, even though he hasn't self-described as an investor? Oh, for sure, for sure. I mean, it's, it's, and, and, and again, you could look to areas like ad retargeting. Uh, I ride a motorcycle, so I was shopping around for helmets on, uh, on the web. And I'm um, you know, now cruising some news website, and I'm being hit with specific helmet ads. So you know, the, the, the technology, and, and, and this is one of those things, and I mentioned it before, we're careful about it. I mean, we have our own view on how to use data appropriately but 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 data is out there and and the the trends are all there in other markets that sell these you know unrelated products and services and I just see uh, uh, you know uh, an ability to target a guy who you have data to, to, to make you believe that he would be interested in something even if he didn't come and, and tell you that and that's what's so powerful about it I found myself the other day looking at a campaign on Kickstarter for some coffee maker, right? These guys developed a coffee machine that, that roasted the, the beans and brewed them like the fastest roast to brew time out there. I mean, I never thought about investing in a coffee maker company, and now I am. So if there was a way to figure out that I looked at that or I had interest in coffee and you were a guy developing that type of machine with some real technology, wouldn't, want, wouldn't you want to know that I exist and to know how to find me? And that is the nature of uh, distribution and solving the distribution problem so that eventually you'll be able to uh, find people with very specific preferences, whether they've told you what they preferences are or you could figure it out through public data and ad retargeting. No different. You're Home Depot and you sell hammers. So you want to market and distribution hammers to carpenters, not housewives. And deals will be the same thing. You don't want to market a deal to carpenters. You want to market deals to investors who would presumably have interest in those deals. This is the same thing, building distribution but specific to deals. Great answer. I, I think we have time for, for one more question. Uh, I'm sorry if we didn't get to your, to your question. We can obviously follow up with Steve afterwards. A um, question came through the, uh, the chat. Uh, do you think interstate legislation will have a larger impact on equity crowdfunding than the federal legislation? Wow. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an attorney, so I should be careful because uh, uh, this borders on kind of legal stuff. Uh, uh, it, it does seem like the states, you know, don't want this to happen. Uh, uh, there, there are all types of uh, groups, advocacy groups that, um, you know, that are pushing for equity crowdfunding to, uh, to be very sort of loose in its rulemaking. Uh, uh, so that everybody could participate and, you know, the states take this position, which is probably their safest one, that there's going to be fraud and there's lots of risk. And so, you know, I, I just don't know uh, uh, sort of a, with the legal bent how much momentum that they will have. I would say that startup investing is inherently, you know, tricky. So uh, I think, you know, the, 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 as I look at crowdfunding, it's, it's less about, hey, you know, now you have an opportunity that you never had to invest in startups and it's more about what's happening with deal marketing where you know the early adopter space which is startups are very fast to grasp the concept and to want to capitalize on it but it's not just about startups and I think that's where the regulators sort of have it all a little messed up 
crowdfunding is just a way to expand your social network, to use your relationships by putting uh, the selling process for your deal online. It's not specifically about, hey, this is a risky startup and now we're going to make it available intrastate and that's problematic. I think that they, they've got it wrong. They're not, they, they're not viewing crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding in sort of the, the, the proper context, which is a little bit broader than just startups. Steve Dresner, uh, founder of DealFlow.com, thanks very much for, uh, for joining us today and delivering a great presentation. Uh, a couple of people asked uh, if we'll make this available afterwards. I will. Uh, we'll send out an email with the presentation. Uh, Steve, how should people get in touch with you if they have more questions? Uh, they could just email me uh, at, at DealFlow.com or call, uh, call into the, uh, the office and they'll, they'll find me. Great. And uh, with that, I think we'll wrap things up. Thank you everybody for, for uh, contributing an hour of your valuable time to, to the series. Uh, we're always interested in covering new topics along the way. Uh, if you have suggestions for topics, you know, we try to do this twice, twice a month on, on two Tuesdays during, during the month. Uh, your feedback is valuable. We're doing this for you. We, we hope, hopefully this is a value add for you guys. Uh, Steve, thanks again, and uh, we'll catch you soon. Hey, thanks so much, Zach. All the best. Okay. Bye-bye.